Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to 1 John chapter 4. Actually, at the end of chapter 3, we're going to kind of back up just a little bit. I'll give you a moment to turn there. We're going to be in 1 John 3, verse 23, through verses, uh, chapter 4, verse 6. And the title of this sermon is Testing the Spirits. This is the Word of God. And this is His commandment, that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as He has commanded us. Whoever keeps His commandment abides in God, and God in Him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Let's pray once more. God, we thank you again for this wonderful text. We thank you for your word that it brings forth life in our lives. And God, I pray now that, God, you would send your spirit here to guide and direct us, to convict us of our sin so that we might turn away from it. God, that help us to be sanctified in Christ Jesus. And God, I pray that for those who do not know you and that are listening to the ways of the world, that God, that they would repent today and that they would turn and that they would listen to your word, listen to how your apostles have written your word through the Spirit. And God, that it would cause conviction and repentance and that it would give life today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you've been with us for a while, you know that we have been going systematically through the book of 1 John. We've kind of started it, and we kind of go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and our goal is to finish and go all the way through the book of 1 John. So throughout this entire book of 1 John, John wants you to know something. And he wants you to know that you've gotten a hold of the real thing. He wants you to know that you know that you know that you are saved. He wants to make sure that what you profess, you actually possess. He wants to make sure that you are in the faith. He wants you to know that you have salvation. And he, wa- and he wants you to know uh, what we call assurance of salvation. As some of you know, this is one of my biggest struggles in my entire life. I went to just multiple churches, not naming anyone specific, but I remember multiple times being at church, hearing the word, believing, trusting in Jesus, but then the call to invitation would happen, and then the question would be asked, do you know that you know? And just being a young Christian, just young in general, I'm like, I don't know, you know, how do you know? Um... How do you know that you're saved? And it, you know, it was a struggle for me, and it was probably more of a struggle for my wife. I remember, you know, as she come to the knowledge of salvation, I remember being there, and she was just like, the question over and over. You know, the guy was just saying, "You got to know," and her answer was like, "How do you know?" I mean, she, it was like a wrestle. I mean, I'm like, just say it, you know. <laughs> um, so it was a struggle. And I'm sure it's a struggle for some of you out there today. How do you know that you're saved? And if you are struggling with that, I highly, highly encourage you to read the book of 1 John. Because one of the major themes through 1 John 
is he uses this phrase, this you know, or you shall know, or by this you will know, over and over. He wants you to get it. He wants you to know that you are saved. He wants you to stand firm on the rock of salvation, which is Jesus Christ. And today he uses it three times in verses 3, 24, verse, chapter 4, verse 2, and chapter 4, verse 6. And so a lot of times after these statements, he'll actually give you a test to kind of make sure that you know. You know it by this. And so today he gives us this test to make sure we are following the correct spirit. You see, there's no such thing as a free spirit. I think a lot of times the world uses that word and it's like, oh, I'm a free spirit. No, no, sir, no, ma'am. You are not a free agent. You are not. You belong to somebody. You have a master. There's a spirit of truth that you're following or there's a spirit of error that you're going to follow. But you don't get to be free. So we're commanded as Christians to test the spirits to make sure they are from God. That's why he begins in chapter uh, 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. You see, you're not to just believe everything that comes out of everybody's mouth. You're not to believe everything just because you saw a meme and you liked it. Okay, just because you saw it on Instagram or Facebook does not make it true. Okay? Um, yeah, you don't get to believe everything. You have to test everything. But you're, the, the goal here in the test, this is imperative. This is a command. Okay, so don't just take my word for it, Eric's word for it. Go and read it. Go check it against the word of God to see if it's true. Okay, that is the commandment. Test the spirits. Why? To see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. You see, before we kind of jump into this, and before we kind of see, okay, what are the tests so we understand how to test it, you need to understand the way the Spirit expresses itself to those who are being saved. And so I've, there are multiple ways, but I have for point number one here, the test of two ways the Spirit expresses itself in our lives. That's why I backed up to verse 23 here. Because John gives us two examples here. One is the Holy Spirit causes us to love one another. Listen to 1 John uh, 3.23. Through 24. And this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandment abides in God and God in him. And here it is. And by this we know, underline it, that he abides in us. How does he do it? How does he make his home in us? By the Spirit whom He has given us. Now, I want you to know there is much confusion about what love is today. And we're not going to dig deep into that, but I, the love I want to talk about, and the love that John is talking about, is the love that comes from the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, as we're looking at how to test to see how the Spirit expresses our, itself in our lives, we have to see what's the fruit of it. That What does it kind of produce in our life? See, the biblical view comes from Galatians 5.22, which says the fruit of the Spirit is love. Not the selfish, sexual love that says that you get to love whoever or whatever you want. The love I'm talking about is from God, and it's the fruit of the Spirit. Because it's this love that we get to know that we're saved. It's this love that testifies to the reality that we are children of God, that are being led by the Spirit of God. So if this is what it's producing, then we can check ourselves to see if the fruit is producing from the root, okay? For instance, how do you know you have a peach tree and not a cherry tree? It's by the fruit, okay? 
Now, I want you to think about this when we say that the Spirit testifies to our life. See, what is a testimony? What is a testimony? I want you to think about this for a second. Imagine you're in a courtroom and you're on the stand and you're being condemned and there's a judge, there's a jury, and there's a DA who's bringing charges against you and against a crime that you have committed. But there's a witness who can testify to your story that you are innocent. That testimony would be highly valuable, would it not? Why? Why? Because it brings truth to the claim. It gives evidence to the claim. And this is what the Holy Spirit does when we humble ourselves and love one another and are being led by the Spirit of God. It's testifying that we are children of God. By this, you know that God abides in you because of the fruit that it's producing. And it is how we love one another. Amen? Second thing that we see how the Spirit expresses itself here is the Holy Spirit causes us to actually believe in Jesus. Listen again to verse 23 from 1 John 3, 23. And this is His commandment, that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. See, if we had to put a thesis statement to the entire Bible, the entire Bible, it would be 1 John 3, 23. This is the sum of the entire Bible. This is the, how we get to come to life. Because that we would believe in the name of Jesus Christ and would love one another. You can see how closely this ties in to love, right? He puts it as one command. Believe and love. It's connected. You see, one of my favorite verses, because you might ask, well, how does the Holy Spirit work to cause us to believe? That's a logical question. And one of my favorite verses comes from John 3.16. Some of you might know it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. This is such an amazing verse. Such an amazing verse. But you see it taken out of context over and over and over. I remember growing up watching the WWF and when it turned into WWE, you know, you would see signs that says Austin 316 and that blasphemous statement. And you've heard Christians say it over and over, but this passage is so beautiful and wonderful, especially when you take it in context for who Jesus is talking to. You see, um, Jesus, in John chapter 3, in the Gospel of John, he's talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus is part of the Sanhedrin. He's a teacher of the law. He's, he, he's the uppity up. He's the guy who everyone goes and asks questions to. And he's a very legalistic man, even racist man, because he is teaching uh, and he is not for, this time, the Gentiles. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night and asks Jesus, you know, Jesus, <coughs> what must I do to be saved? I mean, he's a teacher of the law, right? I mean, he should know how to be saved. But Jesus answers him, you have to be born again. You have to be born again. Logical question, well, Nicodemus, Nicodemus asks, well, how do I do that? Do I just crawl back up into my mother's womb and come right back out? Jesus says, and I love this, you have to be born of the Spirit. You have to be born of the Spirit. You have to. You see, you have to have the Holy Spirit come upon you and cause you to be born again and come to life it has to cleanse you. It has to cause conviction. So now that you, as we follow this, this line through John 3, now you, as you're born again, you would believe in Jesus 
You would cry out to Him as your Savior because you know you're a sinner and you need a Savior and you would trust and believe in Jesus Christ. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit to cause you to believe. And John doubles down on this statement. He doubles down on this commandment. 1 John 5, 1, if you turn to your Bibles there, underline this as well. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, the Savior, God in flesh, has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. There it is again. Believe and love. Believe and love. And you have been born of Him. What's it, that, that born again? That's, he's referencing that again. You're born of the Holy Spirit. You see, but the problem that John was struggling and writing against was that so many false prophets were coming into the church and were denying Jesus that he was the Son of God and that he had come in the flesh. And my brothers and sisters in Christ, listen to me. This is still the danger today. See, I love Mark Dever in his biblical theology book. He quotes his friend who says, The real danger is not unbelief, but wrong belief. Not your religion, but your heresy. Not the doubter, but the deceiver. That's what we have to be on guard about in the church that's the way Satan likes to come in and he likes to sow that deception. Well, is Jesus really who he says he is? is did God really say that? And it starts sowing that heresy and that deception to lead you astray. So John gives the test so that those in the church can know the testimony of the Spirit to determine what is truth and what is error. And so we'll see the first test that he goes into chapter 4 is what is being confessed. We have to know what is being said and ask, is that doctrinally sound? We ha also have to ask, what is coming out of someone's mouth? Does it match up with what the Bible says? That's the first test. So the second test, who are you listening to? See, who are you giving ear to? What is going in to your head, down to your heart, matters. So that's the second test. Who are you listening to? So the test of what is being confessed matters. 1 John verse 2 through 3, or chapter 4, verse 2 through 3. By this you know the Spirit of God. There it is again, underline it. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. <clears throat> and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world. So John, over and over again, gives us the test so that we know that we know God. You see it again. By this you know the Spirit of God. So right off the bat, we know that this is a test that we can have assurance of salvation man that's a glorious thing amen? amen and the test is what do we confess about jesus christ what do we confess see i want you to feel just for a moment the weight of this because this is so important it's a life or death matter of what we confess you see what john is saying here and he's explicitly stating that Jesus was fully God and fully man. This is what the whole entire gospel of Jesus rests on. That he was fully God and fully man. This is kind of what we went over and over again in our Advent series. Because this is what the Bible teaches about Jesus. The Bible does not just teach that Jesus was a good teacher. It doesn't. Even though he did, he does give great teaching. It's not just about his good teaching. It doesn't say that 
Jesus was just a man or just in spiritual form. <coughs> Excuse me. The Bible teaches that Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man. And he is the only one, the only righteous person, because he was God in the flesh who followed the law to a T, but yet was crucified and died at the cross to take our sins upon himself so that we might be called the righteousness of God. John, we see this about Jesus in 1 John 1, verse 2. As he's talking about it, this is kind of like an echo from the gospel account of John in John 1. He says, The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. He was with God but yet was made manifest to us in the flesh. So the question is this. Do you confess this truth? Because it, by what we confess, what comes out of us, we know what's the spirit of God and what's the spirit of error. You see, every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has, uh, has come in the flesh is from God. So we know the Spirit of God dwells in us, and we know that we have eternal life if we confess this truth. Now we have to ask, what does John mean by confess? I think this, is, this word right here, confess, gets a little hairy sometimes with people. Um, some people might take this word confess and just say, well, I just have to pray this prayer. I just have to come down front, pray this prayer, and boom, I go back, confessed it. Or, some people just take it as, well, I just have to acknowledge it. You know, you, you hear this people, hey, how's your relationship with God? Oh, I believe in God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me and God, we, we're on good terms. Like this, you know. And so they acknowledge it. And I think... Many churches believe today, if they can just get people to know these words, everything's going to be great. We're going to add numbers. We're going to boost it. We're going to raise the roof here. So what they do is they start just entertaining people. Maybe if we can, can just get people to acknowledge how cool Jesus is, like they're going to want to acknowledge Jesus, right? I'll never forget I was in St. Louis going to chiropractic school, and we were checking out a church, my wife and I and uh, some of our friends. And I'll never forget, we walked out of that church after service, and my friend, we're in the car, and he's like, man, that place is so cool. I bet MTV could come in there and just like do a, a recording. And I'm like, ugh. I kind of thought about that. I'm like, ah, he was right, you know. Uh, I, but, you know, the whole entire time I'm thinking, like, I don't know if that's a good thing, you know? And it wasn't. But their goal was to show how cool Jesus was. Because people, man, if we can make Jesus cool and kind of give him a little dress up, man, people want to come to know Jesus. So what does John mean by confess? See, confess, the word is homologeo. It's kind of like two words combined. Uh, and it means of one mind. You share a common view. You see the same thing. You, you have a, a, a mind that's in line with God. It's more than just acknowledging or even just saying the words. If he just said, hey, you just have to say these words, he would use a different word, legeo. But instead, he puts homo legeo in front of it. So it's more than just mouthing the words. So what do we mean by this word? I think John uses it again in 1 John 1, 9. He says, if we confess, there is homo legeo, our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
You see, this word, it's, it's like the idea is that you see your sin the way God sees your sin. And now when you see that and you understand that you are a sinner and that you stand condemned, the good news of the gospel and of Jesus Christ that he died for your sin. So now you get to come and you get to ask forgiveness and confess your sin. And guess what? He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. What greater news that you get to come. There has been a way made for you to come and confess your sin and to say, God, I'm a sinner. I have sinned. Please forgive me of my sin. And he says, Forgive it. What greater grace can there be for a sinner? You see, we have to get this right because it's a pass or fail. Verse 3, it says, And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. You might do great things in your life. You might give to the poor. You might start hospitals. You might live a great moral life you might even love people but if you don't believe in jesus christ as the son of god he'll say away from me you workers of lawlessness you see when we look at matthew 7 21 through 23 listen to what jesus says not everyone who says to me lord lord will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven and on that day, many will say to me, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Look at all the good that they did. Do you not see it? They did so much good. I mean, is it not good to prophesy in Jesus' name? Of course it is. Is it not good to cast out demons? Absolutely. Is it not good to do mighty works in the name of Jesus? Of course it is. But what happened? How can God say, denied, you workers of lawlessness? You see one thing they did not say? You know, one thing they did not say, we believed in your name. They did not believe. They saw the power in the name, but they did not believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Away from me. You have to believe in the name of Jesus Christ for salvation. There is no other way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. Do you believe in the name of Jesus Christ? Is that what you confess? This is so important. You see, we have to see what is being confessed and we have to check it against Scripture because there is a spirit of the Antichrist. Verse 3b, This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is in the world already. So I want to just spend a brief moment here. There is an already but not yet presence of the spirit of the Antichrist. You see, we have to take this for what it is. There was a lot of religions that were popping up in John's time. And he's declaring that those false religions were not just the work of free agents, or free spirits. But it was the work of the Antichrist in them. Okay? So that's what it's already in the world. And so just kind of given a quick bit that this it's going to come to a culmination. When we see that the spirit of the Antichrist will give birth to the Antichrist, which is in Revelation 13:5, which is called the beast. And it's going to be empowered by Satan. Uh, 2 
Thessalonians 2, 3 calls this the man of lawlessness, the man of doom and destruction. And he is the final antichrist that will come. And the same spirit that John is referencing kill will empower him in the last days to bring confusion and deception to the issue of Jesus Christ, his person and his work. That is why John calls him the spirit of the Antichrist. And we see this, John has doubled down on it multiple times in 1 John 2, 18. He says, children, it is the last hour and you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know it is the last hour. 2 John 1, 7, it says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is a deceiver and the Antichrist. So the point here is that those who rightly understand Jesus Christ and portray him and his work accurately prove that they possess the spirit of truth. That is the point that John is making here. So the third thing, and the third point, we have to ask not only what is being confessed, but who do you listen to? Who do you listen to? You see, I remember one time I was 15, 16, around that age. And this is during kind of the mid-90s. Uh, and some of you might have known this. Uh, see, I lived in Eufaula my entire life. I went to school at Eufaula and all of my life. And during this time, about 15 or 16, it was really, the cowboy thing was really in, okay? And it was really cool when you wore boots or your Doc Martens, uh, which I think are making a comeback. And you were really, really cool if you not only had your boots, jeans, but also a Carhartt jacket. Some of y'all have those, I see, and y'all are cool. Uh, <laughs> But you are really, really, really cool if not only you had your boots, your car heart, but if you dipped tobacco. Uh, so, of course, you know, the law was still 18, and I was about 15, 16. And uh, several of my friends had a can of tobacco, and I was able to attain one of those cans of tobacco. So one of my friends, you know, we we're just kind of hanging out, and we kind of were kind of out in this field, you know. And I thought, man, we're cool. You want to dip a tobacco? Because all of our friends said it was good. It was cool to do. And man, I remember that night like it was yesterday. Uh, you see, what I really didn't know is that you weren't supposed to swallow your spit at that time. No one told me that. See, because once you do that, the amount of nicotine is high, okay, as you are just swallowing it as it upsets your stomach. And so I'm sitting there out in the field, and, man, we're just kind of standing around talking, and next thing you know, I'm like, man, i got to lay down. And I lay down in this just pasture. It was just a field. And I'll never forget, I look up, and the stars are spinning. Spinning, and next thing you know, I'm vomiting. Um, thinking it's actually going to get better, and it gets just worse because I'm still swallowing the spit of tobacco. <laughs> so I lay there. I lay there for several hours. Uh, once I recover, we drive back to the house, and uh, I remember I wake up the next morning thinking, "Oh, everything's going to be better." And not only am I still sick but I'm actually now covered in chiggers. Uh, so the point I'm trying to make here, who's in your ear? You see, I had all of my friends in my ear. Man, this is cool, this is cool, this is cool. It was not cool. It was horrible. You see, when people are in your ear, saying and whispering hey this is that's not true about jesus was he really fully god fully man did he really die for your sins you i'm sure you're a good person who's in your ear you see john says in first john 
4, verse 5. Those people, look how, look how he uses these pronouns here. He says, they are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. They're just, they, they're not of God. They don't have the Spirit of God, and they're whispering all these deceptive lies. They are from the world. They are from the Antichrist. They listen to them. The world listens to them. You see, just quickly, during his time, uh, there was a couple of um, re false religions that were popping up. Do uh, I might say this right. Docetism. Docetism, that's it. Docetism was a belief that Christ only seemed to have a human body and to suffer and die on the cross. It's the idea that Christ's divinity did not participate on the cross. So God fully could not have participated on the cross because he's fully God. There was Gnosticism, which was a matter that matter or the bodily form was evil. So it didn't matter what you did as long as you say you were in the spirit and had a revelation from God. And you might think that's crazy. Surely to goodness, we don't have that. We do have that. There are people who will actually come up and knock on your door being real nice and kind and give you false, false religion. And they'll try to sell it to you. Wrap it up real nice. We have the Jehovah's Witnesses. They believe that Jesus is the Son of God, they say, but that he is not God, capital G. He was a created being whose life began as the archangel Michael. He is a lesser God, not God. His spirit was raised, but not his human form. We have Mormons. They are ones who diminish the cross. Like Robert J. Matthew from BYU explained that it was, the, it was in Gethsemane. On the slopes of Mount Olives that Jesus made his perfect atonement. It was in the garden, not the cross. By shedding of his blood, more so than on the cross. They diminish the cross. They believe it was an agonizing Savior, just not a crucified Savior who atoned for sin. And they will even admit, oh, Jesus is eternal. That's a catchy little statement. See, they believe that Jesus always will be, but not always has been. Ultimately, they believe in two different Jesuses. You see, the point of this text that John, and I don't want us to miss it, is not that we label every spirit of the Antichrist. It's so that you would know the Spirit of God. And you would know him and listen to him because it's what you listen to that matters. It's what you're, you give your ear to that goes into your heart that matters. You see, when we jump to verse 6, he says, We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and of error. You see, we live in an area that is very much populated and controlled by what we call full gospel or full spirit people. For example, one night Chris and I were walking around the lake and we were kind of coming by the little tabernacle there by the cove. And man, you heard it. They were having a revival, which I'm not against, outside. I love having service outside. But, I mean, they had, driv they had drug out a full-blown piano out there. Not a keyboard, a piano. And, man, there was a lot of dancing and, and talking. And I'll never forget, I heard the pastor say, as they're wanting to pray for someone, someone come down here and give this woman a word from God. And what he was doing is, come down here and speak in tongues. And give this new revelation to this woman of how her life is going to change. And I almost took out my phone and went down there and started reading the Bible. 
Because they weren't putting together that if we are in the Spirit, the Spirit of God and the Word of God go hand in hand. So when John is saying here, we are from God, he's referencing the apostles and the writers of the New Testament. And whoever knows God listens to us. See, look how he's using we, us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth. There it is, underlined. Do you listen to the word of God? You see, the Spirit of God and the Word of God work together. That is the way it works. So what goes into you matters. You see, there is a truth of this passage that's kind of underlying it. As we started, that it's the truth of this passage, as we kind of earlier stated, is that none of us will listen or confess Christ unless the Holy Spirit overcomes our resistance and gives us ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart that follows. But you might say, where do we see that truth in this passage? And it's in verse 4. John tells him, little children. He's talking to the church. He calls them children. And they're children because why? Because he says, you are from God. You have come out. You are from God. You are his children. And he gives them this statement. And you have overcome them. You see how he's referencing they, them? You have overcome these false prophets. These people who are led by the spirit of the Antichrist who are trying to lead you astray and deceive you. You have overcome them. This word is where Nike gets its word. Overcome or conqueror. How did they overcome it? Did they just use their own strength? Did they just kind of outwit or outthink the false prophet? No. For he who is in you, See, he who is in you, who you are from, he who abides and rests in you is greater than he, which is Satan, who is in the world. This is the truth. See, we see at this one truth, this text shows the sovereignty of God, how God is in control of all things at the work in the life of the believer. And it's through the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. And by this, you will know that you are saved and have a relationship with God. So in conclusion, for believers, I'll leave you with this. There's two things. Do not attribute your salvation, your love, and perception of Christ to yourself. Give glory to God. Because He's the one who has caused you to be born again and come to life and to love the Lord and love others. Second, when you encounter the adversary, the false prophet, when you're being uh, tempted and discouraged and you fear or you have uh Uh, just a spirit of fear. You need to preach this text to yourself. Reassure yourself with the knowledge that the one who is in you is mightier than the one who is in the world. The supreme being, God, dwells within you. Rely on Him. Have faith in Him because this is what conquers the world through the power and residing of the Holy Spirit. For unbelievers, maybe you don't believe in Jesus Christ just yet. You might ask, well, how do I come to know him? 
You see, faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. See, by hearing the Word of God, we understand from today's that the work of the Holy Spirit will cause you to be born again. Acknowledge that. Seek the might and help that the God would lead you through His Spirit and cause you to be born again, cause you to confess, cause you to have a love for God and a love for others. Implore Him. Ask Him to remove your heart of stone and request that He gives you the joyful declaration that you can say, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the protector, and He is now my master. Amen? Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for the grace and the mercy you've given us through Christ Jesus. Lord, I pray that now you would be with us as we respond to this message. That, God, you would bring to life those who do not know you. That you would give them eternal life. You would give them a heart, not of stone, but of flesh. God, you would cause them to become alive. Lord, we love you. Help us to love you more. Help us to love the brethren more. In Jesus' name, amen.